everyone. It's Stephanie again with a patient story. And this is segment three of our conversation with Lewis. Um, Lewis, you just got done sharing, you know, your RCHOP, six cycles, the methotrexate, the PET scans, the PIC line, all of the, all of the, all of the good stuff and the side effects and how you dealt with them. So thank you. And this segment is really focused on the mental, emotional, spiritual, if you will, impacts to our lives after a cancer diagnosis. And so there's a lot to cover here. Um, I want to start where you left off, which was, you know, it was less about you and more about your family when all of this finally, there's no real ribbon, but at the end it was like, okay, you're, you're done. You're in remission now. Um, I'd like to ask you what, what is your guidance for other people in terms of balancing sort of like carrying the responsibility of your family's emotions and not wanting to burden them, so to speak, but then also protecting yourself. You know, I think there's this fine line with right. like, yeah. Right. yeah I, I know what you mean. Um, and, and, and I guess the best advice that I can give to people who are newly diagnosed or struggling with the emotional impact of the diagnosis or, you know, maybe struggling with, with survivorship. And, and I, I'm, and we'll talk a little bit later about how I needed to learn this because I was casting myself against type basically, is you have to stay connected to the world of the living, whatever that means for you, all right? Because there's, when you get a cancer diagnosis, I don't care how optimistic you are or how strong you are or how spiritual you are, it's a shock. And, and cancer may be a disease of the bones, it may be a disease of the brain, it may be a disease of the B cells. It's also a disease of intense loneliness. And it's a disease of intense fear. And, and, and it's, it's a disease of an intense disconnection with who you were and who you thought you might be. You know, and you, you have to fight against that. And that's a fight where, thank goodness, Little victories mean a lot. You know, um, you do not need to be that person who's running a marathon, you know, while dragging their chemo thing on wheels. You know, you don't have to climb Mount Everest. You know, you don't have to do some 10 by 20 foot mural about, you know, what it meant to you. But at some point, you gotta, you gotta dig deep and you gotta find that little scared, almost imperceptible voice that says, hey, I'm alive. And you have to do something with it, you know? And so for me, I, I think that was I concerned about leaving my family too soon? Um, was, was I in fear of, you know, you know, the, the magical story that's been, you know, my love story, my marriage with my wife ending. And uh, did that hurt? It hurt so much. But it was also part of the cure. You know, it was like, hey, you know, you want to die today? You want to give up today? That's great. Be honest. That's where you are. But so what's going to get you out of bed? What's going to get you to actually make toast? What's going to get you to log on? It's like, well, I want my kids to be proud of me whether I live or die. You know, and that's, and that's, I think, Yes, take care of yourself, but understand that as the patient, and I think this does not get spoken enough in sort of cancer circles or survivors forms or whatever, it's very important that you take care of yourself. It is equally as important to recognize that taking care of others while you are going through this is a form of taking care of yourself. I'd love for you to expand on that because no. I think that's fascinating. Is it, I, I think is it that, just part of your... You know, my, if, for example, you know, I, I, I work, you know, at an agency that deals with, with uh, populations disabled and uh, elderly. And, you know, one of the things that I do for them is essential. I find resources for them, right? And, and these are folks who, you know, have, you know, maybe have been taken advantage of. They have very little in terms of, you know, social network, um, you know, resources for self-advocacy or whatever. And my, my ability to force myself to work through my illness was crucial, crucial to my survival. Because no matter what I felt like, 
no matter what was going on in my head, no matter how many times I sat on the pot, you know, no matter how tired I was, if I logged on to my computer and spoke to my team and did my job, I was helping other people. You know, I, I was here in the world we live in and I was helping others. I had a purpose. You know, I, I was not a cipher. I was not a number. I was not a statistic. I, I was a person whose words and whose ideas um, and whose actions mattered. No, that's so powerful. By the way, Lewis, when you said this is a disease of extreme isolation, I kind of got a little emotional, I will say, because yeah. it's, it really is. I mean, the way you put it, I think is almost perfect. Um, and, and, and yeah. along with that, I think there's with the isolation, it's this experience, of course, that is so singular sometimes feeling. And part of that too, I don't want to jump too much, but with the hair loss, I just don't want to forget about that because for a lot of people, that's that's part of this disconnect in terms of identity, like being isolated, feeling like I'm the only one going through this, at least in my circles. Hair loss is, it can be pretty impactful. And just for you, what was that like? I think for me, the, the, the and, and I, I think you're right, I think people have different sort of uh, ways of dealing with it and things impact. For me, what was impactful was not the day that I shaved it. For me, what was impactful was the week to 10 days that I let it get sort of ready. You know, for me, like the, the slow process of, oh my goodness, my comb is full of hair. You know, oh geez, look at the drain. Oh my God, I, you know, I've done the best that I can, but I can still see, you know, three inches of scalp. You know, that, that sort of that, that slow, that slow denigration and loss of your visual self image um i think for me was hard actually when i shaved it it was like you know what i'm not going to negotiate with terrorists i'm i'm taking control i'm taking it all off and me and my bald head are going to fight you until the last freaking hill you know and so for me like it was the it, it was the the sense of helplessness and watching it go slowly and knowing that it was just going to happen, you know, that, that really was painful. The empowering and, act of shaving, right. Of taking yeah. things back. Yeah. I, you know, you talk about helplessness and I couldn't help but remember also going back to one of the previous segments talking about the scan anxiety, which is a huge topic. And I just, I don't want to let go of that because I don't want to forget to talk about it. Um, yeah. Helplessness is, I think a, a good word for what, what we feel when we have scan anxiety and, how, how would you tell people, you know, how, what helped you, I guess, get through these different moments of scan anxiety? Um, I, so that's, that's an interesting question because I think there are two answers to it. One of them is just time. You know, your scan is on a certain date and that's it. And you're going to get the results on a certain date and that's it. So you're going to get through it regardless or not. The question is, what's your emotional state going to be, right? Well, well you get through this. And, and I think that, you know, for me, I, I think one of the things that helps me with, with this anxiety, whatever, is, and I think, and I will tell this to anybody who's being newly diagnosed in the middle of treatment, at some point, you have to trust the person that you become fighting cancer. You know, you just have to trust them. And you, you have to be proud of them. And you have to let them help you. Because you're not who you were. That person's gone. And they're never coming back. But it's still you. And there's this new, and there's this new person. And so I, I would say for anxiety, it's like, you know, trust the science, understand that optimism is not a dirty word. Um, I mean, it sort of is my emotional framework, but that's just me, right? But, you know, it's not really a dirty word. And also, you just don't know what you don't know. You know, I, I think one of the things with cancer is Wow, I've been tagged with this. What else does the universe have in store for me? Geez, if I got cancer, it must mean that my first scan is going to be a disaster. Geez, if I got cancer, it must mean that it's already in my hips. Geez, if I got cancer, it must mean that, you know, I'm going to be refractory. But you don't actually know those things. 
Right. These are emotional voices reacting to pain. Right. No, yeah. absolutely. And actually, this is a great another segue into. I just want to make sure we have time to cover this because I thought I thought it was so interesting when we talked about it in our first call. You said optimism is a dirty word, <laughs> and we did talk about how it was. I, I think really relevant for your voice to be to be spotlighted with the how to survive cancer as a pessimist. I mean, I just think oh, yeah. that a yeah. lot of people would identify with that. I mean, whether it's pessimism or you know cynicism or something or realism, you know, it's like um, people, you know, have different ways of thinking about what they, I think, what their mindsets are. I would say this: I'm naturally a very pessimistic person, and I was very pessimistic when I got diagnosed. I mean, I. My wife got tired of listening to me. You know, I'm a goner. It's all over, you know, right? You can only imagine like the shock, right? And, you know, and I spent too much time. Um, I did not do things that helped my emotional state for probably a significant portion of my treatment. I was too passive. I mean, not in terms of, of, uh, of dealing with my oncologist or whatever. I was sort of dealing on two tracks. You know, one track was who I was as a patient. And that person was active and listening to my doctor's recommendations and, and emailing them and, and making all of my appointments and moving forward. The other person was who I was not dealing with the medical side of things. And that person was a disaster for a long time. They were scared, they were helpless. They, they weren't moving around. They weren't taking those walks, you know, and it, it's, and that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that my diagnosis, well, first of all, my symptomology, then my diagnosis, and then my early treatment just flattened me as a human being. It, it took so much from me in terms of the ability to fight and the ability to be and, 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 and the ability to connect, right? And my message for you know, my, my fellow cancer tribesmen is if you've been diagnosed, right, or you're having the symptoms or you're doing treatment and you're doing everything wrong and emotionally you're just shattered and everything's broken and there's nothing, there's nothing except this cold wind that blows through you every day from the moment you get up to the moment you fall asleep, that's okay. You can still survive. And you can still turn it around. You know, don't feel bad. It's all right. Yeah, you're a lump on the floor. You know what? Lumps on the floor, they have a right to live too. You know? I, I love that because what you're essentially saying, what I'm hearing anyway, is it's okay to 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 have whatever response or reaction you have. Okay. Um, but allowing yourself to, to, to be that way is much better than being that way and then feeling guilty about it, right? Or feeling badly right. about it. It right. becomes I, a I, I think, cycle. Right, because I, right. I think that it goes back to, to what I said about trust yourself who you are as a cancer patient. Because think about media representations of cancer and, and popular ideations of what a cancer patient might look like and what they're supposed to do. We're supposed to be noble and helpless. Right, we're supposed to, you know, live in the moment every day and live every day as if it was our last, while essentially having no hope that we're going to have an outcome that's anywhere near like someone who doesn't have cancer. And it, it's such a harmful and skewed vision of who we actually are. We're human beings, you know, um, and not having cancer is not a guarantee that, you know. You're going to make it to that, you know, hundred year party, you know, or anything like that. And it's no guarantee of happiness and it's no guarantee of anything. Right. So, you know, at some point, understand that this, this, this emotional damage, this fear, this, this reeling is part of the journey, you know, and, and I think one of the things that helps is when you take your first step beyond it, you know, and it's not perfect. Right, because here I am, you know, I think, you know, I'll be six months in remission, I think in a few days. Gee, that's great, right? What does it mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything in and of itself. It doesn't mean that I'm cured. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna, you know, be alive in 10 years. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna be, you know, a 
but why do 20? What it means is that I'm six months into mission and I got today. And what am I going to do today? How am I going to help somebody today? How am I going to be seen today? How am I going to see other people today? That's really important. And I would encourage, encourage people when they say, well, live every day, you know, like it was your last to really shut that message down. Because to me, that message works best when you cut it in half and you just leave it at live every day. Thank you so much, Lewis. That I think was incredibly, um, and I'll point you in, I think that'll resonate so much with people who are watching and reading this. And I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing your story um, to help other people. Yeah, no, no, listen, not a, not a problem. I really wanna thank you for, for doing this channel. Um, you know, uh, I think it's uh, such an antidote to, to the loneliness that comes along with the diagnosis and the treatment and just the new reality. And uh, please accept, you know, my best wishes. Um, and you know, I know what I'm talking about for, you know, your continued, you know, good health and happiness. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, I, I don't want to get to it, but I just, I do really want to say how grateful I am for people like you who um, go out of your way to share your voice because you know that it's going to lift somebody else up and, and this channel wouldn't exist without people like you. So again, thank you, Lewis. We're going to keep in touch and yep. hopefully do more work, more of these conversations together. And for yep. anyone who wants to continue, um, to uh, read or watch Lewis's videos and stories, please head to the patientstory.com where we give human answers to your cancer questions. Thank you. All right. Peace.